to strap in and get ready. The leaders in NRL Supercoach are incoming. Bringing you the ultimate insight to help you win your leagues and climb up the rankings. You're now listening to the Insight NRL Show with your hosts, Brain, Matrix, and Whisperer. Yes, g'day guys and welcome back to another episode of the Insight NRL Show. A little bit of a different one. It's only me uh, on the SC Brain. I'm writing solo on this one for the very first edition of our Insight Unlimited Q&A episode. These are going to be coming to you every single week to answer the questions from our Insight Unlimited members inside the Discord. So obviously every single week uh, in the Discord, all of our members get to ask as many questions as they want. We put this one together and answer them all in podcast format for them. So hopefully a little bit of, uh, or a few gold nuggets, hopefully, or uh, I guess a little bit of guidance or, uh, you know, we're leading them in the right direction, hopefully to making the right changes in their team. So we're going to cover all of those. And of course, this episode is brought to you by Insight Unlimited. It's finally here. It's something we've been working on very hard in the background to bring you the very best of NRL Supercoach and not just NRL, AFL, BBL, and also NBL Supercoach. So if you're in the World Cup, it's definitely in your best interest to get involved and become an Insight Unlimited member. It gives you access to all of our final teams, our trades every single week, our captains, vice captains, loops, uh, exclusive member Q&As just like this one. And you've got access to late mail, injury news, and much more. So all it costs is 25 bucks. Uh, you could, all the link is in the description below. You've got to just jump in the Discord, check out the Insight Unlimited channel inside there, and all the info is there to get signed up and start winning your leagues and uh, beating your mates. So become an Insight Unlimited member today. Now, <clears throat> the reason we are here is to cover all of these questions. So let's dive into those. So Brent, uh, with the first one, asking us, from round one, talking about round one, is this round just an outlier in regards to playmakers and creative players not scoring very well? I think it is. Um, I think obviously we, we see it every single year that every year we see the, I guess the attacking players start kind of slower than you would normally think they would um, purely because the game is one up the middle in these early rounds. We see a lot of inflated scores from the big men in the middle of the park. We don't see a lot of expansive footy in the first probably four to six rounds, depending on the team, uh, because teams are trying to find their structures. They're trying to find their combinations. So I do think that the the playmakers and the creative players definitely do start a little bit slower than, than your others, but they'll find their feet pretty quickly once they find their structure within their team and, and they get a few games under their belt. So no panic stations on the guys like Nico, uh, Nico Hines, Nathan Cleary, even Mitchell Moses, guys like that, they'll find their work eventually, obviously, if they can stay on the park and stay healthy. Um, We've got second solution here with another question we've got is uh, Matt King, sorry, Max King to Terrell May, a trade, giving up on uh, Max King too early. So worried about kind of uh, bailing on Max King too early. Also, is there any reason that Max King played only 42 minutes? Uh, I went back and had a look at the game. It, it doesn't look like there's any kind of real obvious reason as to King King's minutes. More so maybe the fact that Regan Campbell-Gillard and Junior Bolo only played in the 40s as well. So maybe they were trying to make sure that King was on the park when when those big boys were, um, just to make sure they handled the middle when they were on the park. So um, that's kind of my only uh, takeaway, I guess, from this one. Um, I definitely think it's a bit too early to bail on Max King, though. Um, we know Max King is a big minute guy. He can play 60-plus minutes in the middle of the park. We've seen him do it regularly. He's fit and healthy which is something that can't be said for last year. And he still played through and averaged, I think it was uh, 54 or 55 for the season. So for, for Max King, I think he's a guy that you want to hold on and just be patient with. Uh, he's definitely the best of that bunch in around that price range under 550K along with Ruben Cotter. So you, I think be patient with Max King. Uh, he's, a, he's definitely a hold for now to, to see, just to see what those minutes look like over the coming rounds. Um, we've got Bray Triple Eight is asking: Is it worth holding Spencer Lenu for one week and playing Liam Henry to see how Terrell May goes with JWH back? Now, this is an interesting one for me. I I think there's merit in holding uh, Spencer Lenu for a week on the off on the bench, provided that you're happy to play a Liam Henry or even a Sam Hughes. Uh, I think there's merit to playing one of those guys. I mean, we know that front row forward's such a low upside position. So at the end of the day, I mean. 
yeah, you're going to go and buy a guy like a Flegler. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk around Corey Jensen. Um, maybe you might want to get a Tavita Totola. One, one of those guys sub 500K. You're probably going to get the same kind of output or a very similar within 10 to 15 points of output from a Liam Henry who got 30-odd on the weekend or, or from a Sam Hughes who got 30-odd and looked awful. So for me, I you know, playing either of those guys I think isn't a bad play just so that we get a bit of an extra look. I'm not overly worried about JWH stealing any sort of minutes from Terrell May. I know Terrell May won't play 54 minutes again, but if we can get anywhere between 45 to 50 from him, I think we'll get what we need. Um, but in saying that, you know, with Lenu out and JWH basically replacing him like for like, I think you'll play that Spencer Lenu role. So I, I don't think there's anything to worry about with Terrell May. I think he's a great play. I think he's the buy of the week in the front row forward. He's definitely got to be the number one choice. And, and it looks like I think about 18,000 super coaches agree on that one. We spoke about this one in depth on the uh, Tin List Tuesday episode. So go back and have a look if you want a bit more of an explanation. Um, Zane Beard is, uh, is going Lenu and Arrow to May and Flegler worth using both trades. Now, I guess it comes back to what we just spoke about and whether you're comfortable playing a bench front row forward in your starters this week in your 17. Um, just remember they will be your 17th player as well. They're probably going to be your lowest scorer in your 17. So at the end of the day, any of these guys can really kind of flop, uh, early on. People are running Jamin Salmon in their 17 who could easily go and get a 25. Um, so I'm not overly worried about that. I think going Lenu and Arrow to May and Flegler is, is still a fine play. I think um, we just put our top five front row forward replacements up on social media and we've got Flegler pegged at two behind Terrell May. So with, with the buy next week, it just complicates things a little bit. Uh, that's, that's my only concern is that you're going to have to go and play one of those guys like a Henry or a Hughes or a Farmer Silly or whoever you've got as your, your bench front row forwards. You're going to have to go and play one of those guys next week, which yeah, it's not ideal, but I mean, that, that's the decision you need to make if you're going to go and get Flegler. I guess the other thing you need to consider with Flegler is the fact that he's going to miss five out of seven games through the middle of the year, uh, due to the fact that he's likely to be in the Queensland origin team. And also the fact that the Dolphins have around 14 and around 18 by. So not ideal situation there for the Finns that are playing any sort of origin footy this year. Um, so that's worth keeping in mind. If you're getting Flegler, he might be someone that you're going to be trading come round 12. Um, Matty Granger wants to know about Palacia. Very quick one. Sell him if you've got him. Um, I mean, he's got, I think, 11 in 30 minutes or something like that, and then 15 in 30. His PPM's awful. Um, I don't get sucked in by the starting lock uh, tag and the 13 jersey for Palacia. I think we'll see him back off the bench very quickly. Um, but, yeah, definitely bail on Palacia now. He's definitely not what we thought he would be. Um, Agent Cheese is asking, was Lucas failing the HIA? So he's obviously got a broken nose as well. He's going to miss this week, obviously, from the HIA, the failed HIA, but he's not going to miss any time due to the broken nose. It's purely concussion protocol. Um, so with Lucas failing that HIA, if Kai Pierce Paul comes out looking like a stud this week, is he someone that you've got to grab? Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and say yes. I think Kai Pierce Paul could be that guy that honestly steals this spot in one week. Now, we know that Dylan Lucas is fantastic. He's awesome. Um, he showed us that in the trial. He, he finds the line more often than most edge back rowers. But I think having a guy with the quality of play that is, that is Kai Pierce Paul, I think there's every chance that if he comes out and has a cracker this week for the Knights on that left edge, he could very well earn that role. Now, obviously, does he become an 80-minute player if he starts? Probably not. Probably Lucas comes straight back onto this bench and steals some minutes from him. But in saying that, if he gets the start and he plays 50, he showed us on the weekend, he got 47 in 40 minutes off the bench, played the whole second half, and looked an absolute world beater. There are some big props on this guy. So um, I think if, if we see any sort of inkling of Kai Pierce Paul getting the majority minutes, I think we need to grab him uh, at 345k before that price rockets because uh, it's going to go up pretty quickly, I think. Uh, Pitbull01 is asking, is Arrow to May worth the trade now in round two or do we wait for another look at them both and go in round three? Uh, so Arrow to May, look, obviously with Arrow, Arrow's an interesting one. There's been news that's recently come out from Jason Dimitri, who's uh, basically said that they're going the conservative route with Arrow, so there's every chance he'll only be out for four weeks. They're looking at shoulder rehab instead of shoulder surgery. So great news for Arrow. It just, for me, it just clouds the situation even more. So if you did want to wait and you want to get a bit of clarity on Arrow, you can wait a week on him. It's just a shame that he's 470 or 460k or whatever he is. Like that's a lot of cash just to sit on the bench in round two. So 
not ideal in that scenario. Is Arrow to May worth the trade now? I'd, I'd say it is. Um, the, the, I guess the risk or the re-injury risk for Arrow is that if he doesn't go with the um, surgery route and he goes with the conservative rehab route, from what we've seen from shoulder injuries, especially rotator cuff injuries, is that these uh, you know can very easily re-injure, um, especially for a, a front row forward or a second row forward that's you know taking a lot of runs and making a lot of tackles. Um, it just has one bad fall, one landing on the elbow, and you could be in all sorts of drama, and there could be uh, you know then then surgery required. I mean, we've seen it over and over again, so many times how these these big fellas they have shoulder injuries and they try and work through it, they needle it up, and they. Uh, they end up just re-injuring it, and then we see end of season surgery on these shoulders and stuff. So yeah, I, I think output will be down for Arrow. He looked like he was in all sorts of dramas in in round one in Vegas. So I think I think we probably need to move on from him, and I think it's safe to go to Terrell May this week. Um, we've also got Troz is asking should he swap Fermor, who's on the obviously on the buy and also has no foreign, with Laybutt. Now obviously you're going to have to do that via Jules, but. I mean, I'm. I didn't start with Fermor. I'm kind of happy I didn't now. I mean, when you uh, when you initially see in round one the team list got finalised and Kieran Foran was uh, he was out late, kind of within the hour he he got shafted, um, and w- take nothing away from Tom Weaver, but um, he obviously is no Kieran Foran. I think the excitement for Fermor was the fact that he was going to be playing on Foran's hip, and he isn't now. Um, obviously with the buy this week and then next week, there's question marks around what's going to happen when David Fafita returns as well. Does he go to the left edge where he performed incredibly well last year? Uh, or does he just go and retreat to the right edge, which is definitely their weaker edge, um, in place of firm order to keep the left edge. So yeah, there's some question marks there. I think he's a jump off. If I had him, I would definitely consider using his cash in a way to be able to get on one of these guys that's hot. And look, we've looked at Labart. I mean, there's there's some questions around uh, around Zach Lay, but I'm not 100% convinced yet, but his base is good enough that I think it's safe. Now, Zach Lay, but obviously has a, he had a 32 base last year, which is great for a center wing. Uh, so we're talking Greg Marju type base. Uh, obviously the attacking output, not quite, but we saw 100 on the weekend with a hat trick. So uh, one of them being a penalty try, but so be it. You've got to ride your luck. So Labor, good choice. Is he a slam dunk pick? I don't think so. We didn't have him in our must buys this week, but um, if you want to strengthen up your center wing and you've got a ton of these guys in the two RF that you did really well with and you want to use the firm or cash, can't go against it. Uh, Dr. Hamo is asking, his, so his front row is King and Hughes or Henry, and then his two RF, he's got Lane, Lukey, Smithies, Satili, Safarth, and Salmon. Would you trade Satili Tupanua this week to Terrell May via Jules, or would you wait the week and see his role in minutes without Lenu? I think for anybody asking questions around Terrell May, I think it's safe enough for us to go now. I don't know whether we need to see another week. We know that Spencer Lenu is going to be out for eight weeks, so there's no complication of him coming back in and mucking up the rotation and the minutes. Um, JWH will take the Lenu role. He'll play 30 minutes, I'd say, um, or maybe even max 40. But I think Terrell May, we won't get 54 from him, but I think we'll get closer to 50 than we do 40. And I think that's enough for a guy like Terrell May who scores at a 1.2 to 1.3 PPM. He's a guy you want in your team. Uh, Troz, speaking about the trade boost loophole and whether it is indeed correct that you can effectively move players around who don't have dual by trading them out and back in again. So yeah, this has been something that's been utilized a fair bit um, where you activate your boost and obviously if you don't end up using it, then you don't need to, uh, you don't need to worry, but you can move your players around inside the trade in and trade out section. So when you go into your trade out, um, let's say you're, you're moving on a player that's got dual position, you click the trade out button, uh, it'll take you to the trade section. And then obviously you can then move your players around um, and then trade them back into a different position and not obviously use a trade. So that that has been a loophole that's been used a, a fair bit. Um, you know, so we won't go into too much depth of that because it'll be something you won't use that often. But um, yeah, very handy if you want to shuffle a few jewels around for sure. Um, all right, Bray, Bray is asking, given the Arrow and Lenyu news, is it worth holding one of them? So probably Lenyu due to the fact that he's playing later in the round as a loop option for Hines this week, and it would mean that he would have to play Henry on the field. Or does he look at getting another 500k front row forward? Um, so I guess this kind of echoes what I've spoken about earlier with the fact that you can use Lenu to have a look. You can sit back and, and have a look and see what's going on at, at front row forward. There are no real slam dunk picks aside from Terrell May. 
There's question marks around Flegler and his buy next week. Corey Jensen, we don't know how his minutes are going to go considering Carrigan had to shift to an edge uh, for the Broncos. Uh, obviously when Pia Kura went down. So there, there's question marks around what their rotation looks like. Um, we've got guys like Oregon Kafusi, who's cheap, but I mean, he's always been a 35 to 40 minute guy. So there's no real upside with him. He's just safe. Um, so yeah, the, the Tavita Totola, meat and potatoes. So like front row forward, unless you're paying up to go to Cotter or Max King, or you're paying super premium and you're just going straight up to Haas, AFB, Tino, whoever. Now that Tino's buy is going to be over next week, it, that'll be the time to get him. Um, I think that uh, it, it could be worth holding because obviously with Nico playing Friday night, Cleary playing Friday night, whoever your VC of choice is, if you want to loop and you don't feel comfortable with them, whoever your VC of choice is, you're going to need someone to loop if you don't have a Titans player. So this is something I've been playing around with. Um, whether I'm going to VC or see Nico will make my decision of holding or selling Len Yu. Um, so Inside Unlimited members will find out. It's uh, probably tomorrow or Friday when I make that decision. Now, Velcro Wallet Guy, one, still one of the best Discord names I've seen, is Tui Kamikamika an option to replace Arrow? Played 51 minutes and scored 50 points. Does have the buy in round four. So, yeah, the Storm do have the buy. And I think one thing we need to think about is Nelson Asofa Solomona coming back too. So, Tui Kamikamika, yes, he, he's getting probably inflated minutes at the moment based on that. We've got to see what Nas in this team looks like um, because they are down on a big minute middle guy. So, um, we've obviously seen Nas on an edge too, but I, I think they're going to bring him back in the middle of the field. Um, so Tui might have a, a bit of a five or six minute kind of knockback there. I, I'd expect Tui to play closer to 40 than 50 when Nas is back. So I'd, I think there's maybe better options. Um, in, in I'd probably rather Flegler, even though he's got the buy next week, uh, and just play one of my bench guys than rely on Tui. Uh, Aussie Ray, how much hope do we have for Chan to hold his spot and actually make some money, or should we consider an exit plan sooner rather than later? Look, um, I mean, we've seen one game from him, really. Uh, so uh, it's a bit too early to make a judgment call on whether Joe Chan's going to be the big minute kind of guy that we want. Um, obviously, didn't play it. I, I didn't really expect much from him when I bought him. He's a basement price guy. Um, if we can start to get some 30s and 40s from him, that's fine. Um, that, that's kind of all I'm expecting from Joe Chan. Does he hold his spot? I don't know. We're going to have to ask Craig Bellamy. But I mean, the, the fact that Sean Bloor has been sitting on this extended bench for a while, we don't know what's going on in the background there. Could be a fitness thing, could be a discipline thing. Uh, maybe they're trying to kind of work him into that role on the edge. Who knows? But um, Bellamy's very high on Joe Chan. Um, it was said on NRL 360 in the interview that he did last week that um, he really rates Joe Chan and what he did in the Super League for the Catalan Dragons as well. So um, I, I think Chan's got it for some time. Um, I reckon they're going to give him a fair run and a fair crack at that left edge role before they look at moving on if they have to. Uh, Dr. Hamo asking, final reserve, Tua Peaky or Seyfarth? Interesting one, isn't it? Um, I mean, Tua Peaky seems like the obvious pick just being able to have a starting fullback that you can play in your center wing. Um that he's probably my pick, but I mean, Seyfarth, he's, yes, he's error prone, but he's a workhorse and he gets in and, and he rips in and Benji loves him. So we just don't know how many minutes are going to be there for Seyfarth, but we can kind of assume, I mean, when we look at the Tigers bench, if we quickly open this up, Tigers bench, we've got Caesar, Fenua Pole, Alex Twal, and Samuel Afainu. So, I mean, essentially you've kind of got three middles. I mean, Pole can play some edge too, but it's rare that they'll use him on an edge. So you can expect Twal will be in the middle, Finu will be in the middle, Pole will be in the middle, and then Caesar. We don't know what's going to happen with him, hamstring injury dependent. So um, I would say you've got John Bateman and Papali, both 80-minute edges. Um, it is Bateman's first game back though, so maybe they'll do a bit of shuffling. But Seyfarth, I think he's, I think you're probably going to see maybe 40 to 50 minutes from him. Um, so yes. Oh, I still think if you, it just depends how you like to play super coach. Do you want to go with the upside of Tua Piki who could score you 80 with a try? Or do you want to go safe with Seyfarth who can probably get you 40 to 50? Um, so yeah, that, that's your decision. But my pick's Tua Piki this week. Um, regardless of the matchup, I think he gets through the work at the back there um, at fullback. All right. Uh, what do we got next? Um, Brent wants to know, why are people trading Fermal? I think I answered that one before around just the buy the lack of confidence around him cementing that spot on the left edge outside Foran and the fact that we don't know what Foran's doing, what's going on with him. He's uh, got hamstrings and quads that are made of tissue paper. So 
I mean, if, if Foran sees some extended time on the sidelines, the lack, lack of all confidence of edges, even David Fafida, he's going to have to do a lot more himself. Uh, Perp, what is the viability of Liam Henry or Sam Hughes' starting front row forward again going into week two? I think it's pretty good. Um, I think we saw Liam Henry and the talent that he possesses. He was great off the bench. Um, even though the minutes aren't huge, they don't necessarily need to be when you've got a guy that's 238K priced at a 22. So um, I, I would trust him and he'd probably be my pick out of him and Sam Hughes to actually be my front row forward two this week. If I had to make that decision, if I want to hold Lenu. And uh, I want to, you know, run him at front row forward too for for Henry. I'd probably play that. He is playing the Eels as well. Um, I don't hate that matchup. So um, yeah, I'd probably play Liam Henry at front row forward too if you had to pick between the two. Um, Legless Goanna. Oh, he's asking us for a nickname for Wade Egan. Um, calling him the Band Aid. That's a that's a good one. Bit a bit of humour for the podcast. Why not? Um, maybe we can call him Band Wade. Um, yeah, the poor bloke is in the wars, isn't he? Uh, all right, Edge, keen to go early on one of KPP or Lomax this week so I can use trades next week elsewhere before the price rises. Who would you go early on of the two? And do you gents have any temptation to go early on anyone? Now, I guess first part of the question, would I go early on KPP or Lomax? I think I want to see the Dragons again. Uh, it's it's great to see them playing some good footy. It looks like the culture over at the Dragons is awesome at the moment. So full credit to Shane Flanagan and what he's been able to create in such a short time over there. But And Lomax, he took 20, I think 22 runs for over 200 metres on the weekend. He goal kicks. We know he's going to score tries in the corner there. So I love Lomax, but the price difference is 300k between these two players. So if there's a player I want to go early on, when, you ever, when we're going early on players, there's always risk involved. Um, I think Lomax will score better. But I think KPP could be the guy that we see two to 300K worth of value out of if he keeps that spot. So if I had to pick one, I'd go KPP. I'm not bringing either of them in because I, I feel pretty set on what my center wing looks like and, and also what my 2RF looks like. So I'm not overly worried about that, but I'll definitely be making the jump on KPP potentially next week. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for that one. But I, Kai Pierce Paul is the guy. If, if he can lock that down. If he has a good game this week and you've gone early, there's every chance he cements it and Dylan Lucas comes back off the bench. JD, got Lenu and Arrow. So many questions about these front row forwards. Um, 230K in the bank with Lenu and Arrow. Also love to get KPP, but no front row forward with Jewel and no 2RF that I want to trade. So this is literally exactly the same scenario as me. Um, I have traded Arrow straight to Terrell May. I've left 160K in the bank at the moment. Um, so I can get up to a Flegler potentially if I really do want to make that decision, or I can just hold Lenu on the bench, use one trade and use Lenu as a loop. So maybe, maybe you've got that choice as well. I, I think it, you can wait on KPP for a week. I think that's the smart play. You go early on him and then he ends up being a 40 minute guy off the bench. Yeah. You get about hundred K out of him, but it kind of feels like then you have to trade him out eventually. So you've got to believe that he's going to win that edge spot, um, which a lot of people do. Uh, myself included. I just don't know whether it's going to happen by round three. So we'll, we'll see. Um, Matty Granger, how much of a priority is Taylor May? Uh, getting a 67 in a team scoring zero points is scary. Is he more of a priority than getting a cheapie in? Now, this one's an interesting one. I'm, uh, I mean, look, 41% own Taylor May, by the way. So we're, we're not talking about a pod, we're talking about a pretty popular guy. Now, Taylor May obviously playing on the left. Score to be, to clarify this scoring sixty seven. Uh, he had thirty two in evade, which is just wild. Um, that is incredible. The, and thirty odd in base, thirty five in base. I think it was. So, when you're talking base stats for a center wing, like anything over thirty is elite. Greg Marju, we're talking about the base stat king, had thirty two points per game in base last year. So you know when you're scoring anything above that, you, you're in elite territory. And I think Taylor May at four hundred and seventy k is and borderline must have at the price. Now, the one thing we do need to consider, though, moving forward with Taylor and May is that his matchups over the next three to four weeks. Now, this week, they play the Eels. Okay, yeah, it is Blue Bat Stadium, so they love playing at home. They play the Eels. So he's matched up against Will Panasini, who's a pretty good defender. So that's the first matchup. Then the Panthers have Thursday night against the Broncos, where he's matched up against Katoni Staggs, also well-renowned good defender. Then in round four... We've got the Panthers up against, if I can find it, the Roosters up against Joey Manu. Again, another good defender. So Taylor May's got three pretty tricky matchups coming up. 
this isn't me talking about a tail in May. I think he's a guy that you want in your team if you're one of the 60% that missed out on him in round one. I think it's a pretty easy decision to make. But is it a slam dunk? Oh, I'd probably still say it is. I think regardless of the matchup, you know the base is there. At worst, he's going to score you a 40, and he's going to present value, and you're going to make a tiny bit of cash. Best case, he makes all of those guys look silly and averages 70 to start the year and makes 100 plus K to start the year and you kind of miss out on him then and he ends up being 600k in like five weeks so um too much risk not going with him i don't think he's a guy you need to fade at the price tag especially on such a good team so um yeah i'd say i would prioritize getting tail in may over a guy like kai Pierce paul over a guy like lucky galvin i know a lot of people are getting him at five eight to free up a bit of cash that's fine um i would prioritize getting tail in may because you know that he's a playable center wing every single week regardless of um regardless of matchup and the last one, Cracker 90, if Little, Jacob Little gets another decent score for round two, would you consider the risk of downgrading Grant if it meant you could upgrade Spencer Lenu to AFB or Haas, thus fixing the front row forward headache? Yeah, the, we're all, we've all got the front row forward headache, I think. Um, Grant down to Little would free up probably a good oh, 280K. So then if that means that you can then have enough cash to go up, from Lenu to one of the elite options in front row forward. I'm just I'm just thinking like how much is Haas gonna hurt you? And the answer is he isn't. Um he got 70, I think, in the first round or 60 or whatever. Um I mean Haas hasn't he scored I didn't score 100 last year. Um yes he's gonna get you anywhere between 65 to 80 most weeks. And yeah it would fix the headache but I mean, what's the difference between Grant can go out and get 130 on a good day. Um, he's got through that Panthers matchup now. I think a lot of people, we should have expected Grant to go sub 50 against the Panthers and he got 49. So, I mean, we can't complain about that against the Panthers who are one of the best defensive teams in the competition. I mean, it's only going to get easier for Grant now. So I think I, if you started with Harry Grant and your whole team structure is centered around having a guy at 750K at hooker, ripping this apart now just so that you can go and upgrade a guy in front row forward that's going to get you 80 i don't know whether i'd do that because harry grant could easily average 80 over the next four rounds as well so cracker i don't think i would do it i think i'd stick strong with harry grant uh and i would go up to a guy like a a, a flegler a, you know get terrell may get one of these guys uh, even max king or cotter if you can get up to them um that they're going to get you anywhere between 45 to 65 most weeks anyway. And at, at front row forward, you're only about 20 points away from Haas's best game. So um, I, I would probably stick strong with Harry Grant. Now, um, guys, that brings us to the end. That's the, the first Insight Unlimited members Q&A. So uh, thanks for listening, watching. Guys, if you, if you aren't an Insight Unlimited member and want to become one, all you need to do is join the free Discord. It is in the description below of this video or if you're listening on audio, this, uh, this recording. So go and click on that link, join the free Discord. You'll see a little uh, channel there called Insight Unlimited and all the details are there, how you can sign up and and get sorted and then you can start asking your questions we'll answer them every single week for you as well let's hope for some green arrows for everybody this week and a bit more friendly scores uh all the best for the weekend of football we'll be live on sunday to wrap up the week that was but until then see you next time